Okay, the fifth day of uh, the FCP, FCPS part two refresher course. Uh, today we are going to be focusing on two important areas. Uh, they are both important from the perspective of examination because it is very unlikely that any one of you will not get either a short, or long case, or Toke station not related to urolithiasis or transplant <clears throat> or both. So uh, we have uh, predominantly stone and, uh, and transplant. Uh, even we starting off Dr. Jamshed, uh, assistant professor in Indus Hospital to She's going to focus on perks, pros and cons of uh, and are you there? Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, sir. I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, I think, uh, can you upload your Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamad, for giving me the opportunity to participate in this uh, information course. Today, I'm talking about the upper pole puncture pros and cons. Uh, next, Sharif, up slide change for them, please. So PCNL can be done from any approach from the upper pole, middle pole, and lower pole. In fact, in the upper pole, you can go uh, through a supracostal approach. That is the approach you go in the upper pole below the 12th rib. And the infracostal approach is the approach that is below the uh, 12th rib. Uh, next. So the uh, advantages are uh, from the very beginning. If you see the position for the upper pole puncture is basically very easy and less time consuming because in patient, patient is totally in prone position with no uh, uh, bridge. Next. And uh, you select the upper pole by a fluoroscopy. You can see the fluoroscopic image in which you can select uh, upper pole uh, by placing a uh, artery forcep and then the then mark this area with the, uh, on the patient next and you place your uh, in the very uh, first picture you just place the needle on that mark and then after that you just uh, straight this needle right angle to patient in the fluoroscopic picture you will get this image this is called the bullseye uh, technique and this is very uh, uh, less time consuming and it is straight into the desired calyx. Next. And then you go straight uh, and you push the needle in uh, after rotating the C arm to 10 uh, degree. And you get uh, uh, the image on this fluoroscope and you will be in the system. Uh, and get, you can check that by pulling or out of the uh, stillet. Next. Uh, next, and then you can place a guide wire uh, from uh, you place a guide wire directly into the uh, uh, from the upper pole into the ureter, and it can go from if you put a uh, through the upper pole, you can uh, place that guide wire directly into the ureter. You can see this guide wire is going into the ureter on this fluoroscopic image. Uh, so uh, you can. Anila, can you just explain the uh, triangulation technique a little bit more? Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, first light, uh, Sharif, first light, Karen. Okay. Then next. Thank you. You just placed a, a needle uh, below the, the selected area. First, you have to decide it's a 
upper uh, supra, you want to do a supracostal puncture or the infracostal puncture and you pl uh, place a needle uh, bark this on the um, uh, desired calyx by after retro grid filling of the contrast and in this uh, in this system i uh, prefer the uh, below the co costal puncture and then you just place a needle inside the system like this is that clear neela can you go back so you have put a metal marker on the desired calyx with the patient lying prone and yes. uh, uh, Shreebas. The arm in zero position, zero degree. Yes, yes. The C arm will be in the zero What's degree. The next step? When... Okay. The uh, the next step is uh, Sharif. Next, please. Next step is that you put a LP needle on that mark and then straight the uh, uh, LP needle uh, at right angle to uh, the patient. That at ninety degree, then you will get this image that is showing on the fluoroscope. That's a bull's eye technique. So it's perpendicular to uh, to the patient. Okay. So then the C arm is tilted thirty degrees towards you. No, that's a oppose. Not me. That oppose it to fifteen degree. Fifteen degrees. Fifteen degrees, and then and then, then you. Push the needle further inside uh, the tract. Shall we next, TJ? And then you will go straight into the upper pole. Okay. So this is this is bull's eye technique, right? Yes. Okay. Carry on, please. Okay. And then you place a guide wire after uh, conf uh, confirming the that that is inside the system. शरीफ पीछे कीजिए एक साइड दैट्स सो सो यू कैन प्लेस अ देयर इज अ एबिलिटी सो यू कैन प्लेस अ गाइड वाइड डायरेक्टली फ्रॉम द अपर पोल इनटू द यूरेटर सो दैट दिस एडवांटेज ऑफ द अपर पोल इज मेनली द हायर कॉम्प्लिकेशन रेट Including the pneumothorax and the hydrothorax, and there is a higher risk of bleeding. Uh, but the uh, literature. Next slide. But the literature says the uh, the risk of bleeding is not different between the upper pole and the lower pole. This was the article that was published in journal uh, in Urology Journal. In two thousand nineteen, H in which they assessed the uh, um, that was the study conducted between two thousand five and two thousand seventeen. It's a single a single surgeon experience, and it's a re retrospective study. They divided uh, the whole uh, cohort into three groups: supra and in the group one, they go through the supra supra costal upper calyx. That is above the twelve rib, and the second group was sub costal upper calyx. That's the below twelve rib. And in group, uh, uh, yes, thank you. And in group three, that they puncture from the not from the upper pole calyx. Median size was uh, three point two centi uh, millimeter, uh, three point two centimeter, with a Hounsfield unit of hundred cent, uh, eight hundred uh, Hounsfield unit. And the overall success rate they were quoted is eighty four point eight percent. So in group one, they said that there is a significant higher stone free rate as compared to group three. And the uh, the ninety days complication was twenty point four percent. In in this, the complication rate primarily was the chest tube insertion, which was in the group A. That is the one of the risk factor. Uh, and there was no uh, difference uh, in complication between the group two and two uh, three. So they conclude that upper pole excess, if done below the rib, is safe with a similar complication to the mid pole or the lower pole calyx. And this, in the supracostal ex uh, excess is also effective uh, option to achieve the higher stone free rate uh, free rate in the lower pole calyx stone. Next, 
and that was article that was published in 2015 in which they reported the similar thing stone free rate is more in a upper pole puncture and but the uh, uh, thoracic complication that is a hydrothoric is more in the upper pole as compared to the lower pole uh, next So the take home app message is the upper pole is better in term of posi uh, positioning because it's less time consuming you, you don't need to uh, uh, put a patient in a bridging position and it is a useful tool that facilitate tcnl by providing direct and stable access to the renal calyx ureter upper ureter and uh, uh, lower calyx and if you want to place a dj stand then you can place a dj a dj stand uh integrately by placing the guide wire directly into the uh, ureter and it provide a straight track parallel to because it's parallel to the long axis of the kidney cause less to uh, uh, torque during the uh, of the rigid nephroscope and thus reducing the chance of injuring the infernibular uh, venous vessels and uh, if possible then uh, you can uh, decrease the rate of uh, thoracic complication like the hydrothoric and the pneumothoric by uh, puncturing uh, below the rib next thank you Okay, um, so now I mean uh, the question about there was a question about triangulation technique, and this is what you're describing is the is what the bullseye technique that you yes. go directly into the upper pole calyx. So essentially, triangulation technique is slightly different, and in triangulation technique, what you do is that uh, as Dr. Nila described, you put your metal marker, a needle, or anything and then you mark that point with a cm on on 0 degrees subsequently you rotate cm 30 degrees towards uh, away from you and then mark the point which is now appearing uh, going into that desired calyx and then you create that triangle from these three point from these two points and once triangle is made then this is the point that you need to enter so this is basically a slightly modified uh, way that uh, bullseye technique is and triangulation technique can be used for any calyx however the bullseye technique is essentially for the upper pole calyxial punctures now uh, the question about uh, the axis uh, is that which calyx should you use and why so that that's an important question now generally people use tend to use the calyx which they are used to so for example if you have been trained to do upper pole calyxial puncture people would generally do all punctures through the upper pole calyx whereas if you are doing a lower polar calyxial puncture as most people do uh, you only go through the lower pole calyx uh, you will be able to achieve result with either of the axes but generally what is important is to make decision based upon the patient anatomy and the stone distribution so it is possible that there are certain stones which are uh, possible through the lower pole calyx uh, may not be possible through some other calyx but if you are going through upper pole calyx one of the big advantage is that you have an access to all the calyces now the second advantage about upper polar access is that the posterior laterally and as a consequence the upper pole is closer to the skin than any other part of the kidney now this provide a straight access to the calyx without torque on the calyxial and fundibulum so in lower polar calyxial axis there is significant torque on the calyxial on the infundibulum and there is very rich blood supply of the uh, infundibulum and the torque can cause 
a disruption of uh, those in fundibulum and that can result in significant bleeding. So this is one of the uh, purported example. Although if you look at the clinical experience, the blood loss is, is not very really different. So, I mean, it's, it's whatever you are used to of doing and, and, and what is best in your heart. But you should know more than one or two techniques in order to modify according to the patient. Uh, because sometimes if it's an upper polar X stone, it may be difficult for you to reach into the, uh, sorry, if you have an upper polar stone, it is difficult to reach through the lower pole calyx. The, uh, most, important, the most important thing is the RGP, when you are doing a RGP and seeing the calyx on the retrograde imaging. At that time, you have to decide you are going through the upper pole or the lower pole, what is the suitable thing? Because sometimes the infundibular length is so much and is so narrow that from the upper pole, you cannot reach to the lower pole. So at that time, the RGP is very uh, useful. Right. So if you look at the uh, big series, you find that there is not much difference between the bleeding, uh, yes. bleeding risk or hematuria or blood loss in the two types of axis. So one of the advantage of upper pole uh, puncture is that you have a direct axis and you do not really rotate kidney too much uh, once you are into that upper pole calyx, but uh, you are going through a vascularized parenchyme, right? So for upper pole puncture with the bullseye technique, it is not possible through to go through the brutal yeah. line, which is between the the anterior watershed and the posterior blood supply watershed. So probably that's the reason why the bleeding uh, from the lower and upper pole are not very different. The only thing is that if you have uh, a, a, no calicial disruption, there would not be any significant blood loss. Through. Yes. So, uh, so the key is, uh, the conclusion is that the axis, uh, one should know access various techniques of access and they should modify it according to the patient, right? Okay, so I think we have addressed all the questions. Uh, Dr. Rana, are you ready with your presentation? Yes, please go ahead. Assalamualaikum everyone and good evening. I hope uh, I'm audible enough. Yes, you are, please proceed. Okay, perfect. So, uh, I am Dr. Rashani and I'm working as a consultant urologist in Crush Institute of Kidney Diseases and Shared Home Complex. So uh, as uh, uh, the objective says, my presentation would be centered around two cases, which are basically uh, relevant to the stones, some difficult cases that we may come across in our practice. I will uh, uh, first describe the cases and then I'll put up the questions with the experts. Uh, so moving on with the first case, uh, it is a 55 years old gentleman who has got no comorbids. He has a BMI of 30, uh, 34 and his weight is around 110 kgs. He is six feet tall. So when I asked him to lose weight, so he told me that he has lost 10 kgs. So he was around 120 kgs earlier on. So uh, his symptoms started with a very vague abdominal pain and he was worked up thoroughly. His ultrasound and scans were done and then uh, he went through some procedures and was referred to me uh, to, to our center for uh, lithotripsy on his right side. So I would move on to uh, his scans. So let me have my laser pointer so that I can highlight the findings. Yes. So this is his plain CT scan abdomen with his axial cuts. Uh, uh, you can see that there is bilaterally uh, gross hydronephrosis. And if you uh, trace it further, you can see that uh, there are some uh, calcific densities uh, on the right and also on uh, the left side. So if I move further, again, you can see that uh, uh, there is persistent hydronephrosis and uh, there is hydrourator with stone seen uh, bilaterally. And then you can see that there is a stone in the left ureter as well, and there is bilateral hydrourator as well. So uh, in the other cuts, you can see that uh, uh, there are stones in, in, in the uh, kidney and then in the proximal ureter as well on the right side. And if I define it further, there is around one centimeter stone in the lower pole on the right side. The Hansville units of these stone was around 1100. And on the left side, if you can see that there is a whole train of stones uh, from uh, 
the proximal till till almost uh, the mid of the ureter. And other than that, there are three stones in, in um, uh, roughly three stones in the lower pole of uh, the uh, left kidney as well. So uh, when he presented to me, his right URS was already done and his uh, anesthesia stent was placed. That was done a month back. And as for uh, the patient himself, uh, his left URS was attempted as well, though he was not very sure about it. And surprisingly, the renal functions were normal. His creatinine was one. So this is his X-ray KUB. And uh, you can see that the stent is in place and you can very well appreciate uh, uh, the stones bilaterally. So uh, before I move on uh, towards the discussion and putting up the questions for, for uh, Dr. Hamad and Dr. Anila, so uh, let's discuss about uh, the problems here. Uh, you can see that uh, the patient is around 110 kgs. He has got a high BMI. And then there is a huge stone burden bilaterally. The Hounsfield unit of the stone, which is on the right side, is around 1100. So uh, we know that there are certain uh, contraindications to the lithotripsy, and then there are certain factors which can negatively affect uh, um, the stone uh, clearance success rate. So uh, his stone attenuation is on the high side. He is already a morbidly obese patient. So, uh, so uh, with this uh, background, I would like to move on to my first question. Uh, so Dr. Ahmad, what would you like to keep as a first line of treatment for this right renal stone, uh, ESWL, or would you consider an RIRS in this case? Or so, uh, Anila, there, uh, sorry, uh, Rana, there is a question about uh, the presence of duplex system on the left side. So can we go back to your CT films? Um, sure. I so, don't think so. Okay, there is a duplex system. Yeah. Or... So, I mean, I, I agree. I don't think that there is a duplex system. Uh, there was one comment by Dr. Sana about presence of duplex system. So what do you see in this uh, scan is bilateral urethrohydronephrosis. And remember, when you are doing CT scan, Hydronephrosis is not just blunting of calices, but also, most importantly, the absence of perihilar fat. So uh, when you're describing CT scan, please focus on the perihilar fat. And as you can see, that on both the system, there is hardly any perihilar fat visible. So this is hydronephrosis. Uh, there is a significant uh, stone burden on the left side with the renal and ureteral stone, uh, and what you have is what is called Steinstrasse on the left side. On the right side, however, a stent is placed. Uh, can we move on to your uh, plain x-ray KUB? Do people think that the stent is appropriately placed? Can we move to your uh, plain x-ray, uh, Rana? Yeah, I'm trying somehow it's stuck. Uh, okay. Just give me a second. So please comment if you think that the stent is appropriately placed in the renal pelvis or is it uh, in the ureter? Right, can you see the stent? How many of you think that it is appropriately placed? Please comment. Okay. Uh, not in the pelvis. Well, if you remember the CT scan, there was a big extra renal pelvis, which was lying uh, quite significantly outside with the uh, baggy pelvis. So uh, this stent is likely to be appropriately placed, although in the plain film, it doesn't seem so. Uh, it's not in the calyx, it is in the renal pelvis. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Anna. Yes, sir. It is, it is in, the, in, the, in the pelvis. So there was a big, big dilated pelvis. Yes. And uh, uh, so the stent is in place. The question about uh, the treatment of this right lower polar stone, which is, I think it seems like close to about... 10, 11, 12 millimeters. Is that correct? 
Yes, sir. It's it's around one centimeter. And, and so it's a one centimeter region. stone in the lower pole calyx. And if you look at the guidelines, uh, they recommend that anything more than one centimeter should basically be treated by RIRS rather than by lithotripsy. And particularly for this gentleman who is rather obese. So there are uh, a lot of people have actually responded and, and, and you are right. So do you agree <clears throat> that RIRS is the way to go with the double J, with the on the right side? Yeah, but uh, I absolutely agree that that's what uh, my first uh, instinct was. But the trouble is that many a times we uh, where we are working in centers where we don't have the facility of uh, an RIRS and a laser. So in that case, we if we uh, talk about uh, practically then we have to give it a chance with the lithotripsy and that's what I did actually in this case. So that's fine. I mean, uh, we know that uh, there could be handicaps uh, about your ability to do it and the uh, uh, availability of infrastructure or instruments. So that's fine. I mean, uh, what people would consider a mini perk or mini PCNL if RIRS is not available rather than lithotripsy? Yeah, that certainly is, is uh, can be the second line option. Okay, fine. I think uh, that's what the majority opinion is that yeah. uh, uh, because of his obesity, the skin to scone distance, uh, lithotripsy may be difficult, but if you are successful, then that's nothing beats success. Okay, I think we can move on to your next question. Uh -huh. So as I highlighted earlier on, say that this patient was referred to me from elsewhere and as for the patient, a URS was attempted on the left side and that was a failed attempt. So I don't know what were the exact reasons of the failure, were they unable to negotiate or, or whatever they, the reasons were. So uh, the next question that I had in my mind is that uh, should uh, 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 a treating physician, I, I re-attempt a URS on the left side So uh, what about left side now? Would you consider uh, what, is, what is the way to go? How would the residents feel about doing RIR, uh, URS on the left side or you want to do something else? Okay, so yeah, Fahad but... thinks that uh, URS should be done and then subsequently, uh, RIRS for the renal stones. Yeah, so I've got quite a few comments uh, where I think almost everyone thinks that I should be re-attempting a URS. And uh, two people have mentioned that I should be going ahead with the URS along with the laser. So that's what my second question was, that will laser fragmentation any uh, uh, will make any difference in, in the re-attempt? And then we should not forget uh, that there are stones in the kidney as well. Right. So there are two points. So number one, which is saying that you put a, a, a nephrostomy tube first and then do your RIRS or URS. Uh, about the use of energy. Now, remember that uh, this is a very dilated system. And when you do URS, you have an issue with retropulsion. But since you have a huge train of uh, stone, a very significant stone burden, and if, if you are able to clear about 80% or 70% in first go, you will not be able to clear all these stones in one sitting of uh, URS. So it doesn't matter you use laser, you use pneumatic lithotripsy, either one is good because you will not have any significant retropulsion of a stone until you reach to the top of your stone, which is the, 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 the biggest stone at the top, the most proximal one. So until that point, you will still be able to do and use any energy source and it doesn't matter. But once you reach to the top, then you probably can plan it with Flexi and do the top one with URS and then subsequently the kidney ones with your RIRS. So Dr. Haman, do you have any comment about the, uh, uh, any preference for the laser settings in, in, that case, in this case? Because I think I should be doing dusting here rather than uh, using the fragmentation. Yeah, I mean, with such a that? huge stone burden, 
if you start fragmenting the stones using the fragmentation settings, and remember, uh, majority of the laser machine that we have at the moment in Pakistan have two uh, settings. One is uh, the energy, which is uh, in joules, and the frequency, which is in hertz. Yeah. In manipulation of these two settings, we'll be able to give you either the dusting or fragmentation settings. So if you use high energy, you will be fragmenting stone. If you use low energy and high frequency, you'll be dusting stones. Now, if you start to use a, a fragmentation setting on this stone, you will find that you have to remove these fragments and there will be hundreds of fragments from even a one centimeter stone. So the best thing is that you use the dusting setting, keep dusting it as far as it's a time consuming thing. It is, uh, these stones looks like mixed density stones with uh, some uh, softer element and uh, some calcium oxalate, uh, either mono, mono or uh, dioxalate type stones. So there is a possibility that it will take some time but uh, it will be less cumbersome and your in and out of from the uh, ureter will be less. So the chances of trauma is reduced significantly. So uh, just to I want to say one thing. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Uh, yes, um, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed was uh, saying a, a pushback as much as possible. I want to clear the pushback in these cases sometimes is impossible. You cannot go and push back all the stone, which is up to the majority. And one of them, uh, Dr. Elahi Bhaksh was saying, uh, sorry, uh, okay, not a PC. Thank you, sir. So uh, I agree with you, Anila. Uh, the, uh, the, when you are starting off from below, uh, pushing all these stones into the kidney would be difficult. But once you have um, reached up to the middle of the stone, and you use uh, some air, uh, some uh, water irrigation pressure, you probably may be able to push this stone, but sometimes these stones are badly adherent to the mucosa. These are impacted stone, difficult to push. The idea of pushing back these stones into the kidney is to remove them by a percutaneous axis, and that would provide you uh, a quick clearance of the stone burden. So just for the purpose of generating more discussion, because uh, uh, the purpose of all this talk is, is academic. So uh, Dr. Ahmad, how important is the power of the machine that we are using? So how does that impact the fragmentation? So remember that uh, for stone fragmentation, uh, what you need is between eight and 15 watts uh, at the most. Uh, and you'll be using uh, in the ureter about 365 micron fiber or where about depending upon the machines. Now, uh, if, you, if you have a 20 watt or 15 watt laser, that is good enough. You don't really need a uh, uh, high power machine. The only advantage of high power machine, which has a maximum of two joules energy and 50 Hertz of frequency. So if you have two joules of energy for a 100 watt laser and 50 watts, 50 hertz of frequency, you'll be able to use uh, very effectively the dusting technique with very high frequency and low energy. So something that I start off is 0.2 joules and 50 hertz. So that gives me 10 watt power and it really does the stone, you surface paint the surface of the stone moving your laser fiber in and around over the stone and you'll be able to dust them. So uh, in the comments, I can see one question from uh, Dr. Sana Hussain. Uh, so uh, she says we need to clarify the power used in kidney and in ureter. So probably she's trying to ask the settings if there is any difference in the settings between the kidney and the ureter. So Sana, am I correct? Uh, have, I, have I understood your so question correctly? Yes, she says yes. So uh, there is there is no difference. Uh, you will be using a high uh, a diameter fiber in the ureter, which is 365 mm -hmm. microns. The advantage of 365 micron fiber is that it's burnout using prolonged fragmentation will be less and uh, you don't really need a fiber which can bend. But when you are in the kidney, 
use can use a similar settings, but then you can you have to use a 200 micron fiber because it can flex with your scope. Uh, the uh, advantages uh, of using a high free, high caliber fiber is basically that you will be saving your 200 micron fiber, which is expensive and which you really needed in, uh, in, in kidney stones. But what really happens is that once you start your fragmentation, you determine the ability of your laser to fragment stone and you can modify your various settings uh, accordingly. And then you will be able to um, adjust it according to the stone uh, density. So you may have to increase power uh, in terms of joules and decrease uh, frequency uh, and you will find the right frequency and, and power uh, to adjust to that stone. Right. So uh, there is one comment from Dr. Mustafa Khalil Gondal, and I'm not exactly sure what he's saying. He uh, he has written that we should be doing a PCN and sandwich therapy. So I'm not sure what is sandwich therapy. So basically sandwich therapy means that you sandwich uh, uh, one treatment option with another treatment option. So generally sandwich therapy implies that you use PCNL plus ESWL uh, or um, so you can use this term anywhere, but essentially the combination of PCNL and ESWL was considered as a sandwich therapy. Okay. All right. so, so I think uh, we can have to quickly move to the next case because we are running out of time. Oh, right. So... But still, I had one more question, so I, I think we can skip that. Uh, somehow it's not moving. Yeah. So the next case is a 45 years old gentleman who has got no comorbids. He presented to me with right flank pain, and he has history of renal cancers and a right solitary kidney in two of his uh, SIBs. And uh, he, when he presented to me, he had a CT scan with him. And uh, if I highlight the findings of the CT scan here, you can see that in the right side, the system is somewhat dilated. And then there is a small stone that you can appreciate. And uh, uh, you can see, if we go further below, that in front of the vertebrae, there is a fusion of the renal uh, parenchyma. So I think uh, the diagnosis is, is uh, pretty evident by the highlight of findings. So uh, a few more sections. So here you can again appreciate that um, roughly uh, in front of the L3 vertebrae, uh, the two kidneys, uh, lower pole, there's a fusion of the lower pole of the two kidneys, uh, which implies that this is a horseshoe kidney. And then there's a lower pole stone in, 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 in the right kidney. So uh, this stone is again less than one centimeter uh, and a radio pack stone with Hounsfield units of uh, 900. So, uh, Again, the question in this case that this is a, a complex anatomical situation that is a horseshoe shaped kidney that we do not see very, very commonly. So in such case, uh, uh, should we choose a ESWL or, or should we go ahead with our ARS? So uh, the floor is open. Uh, there is mixed opinion about ESWL versus RIRS majority thing that uh, is the uh, RIRS be done? Yes, uh, I think majority is in favor of RIRS. Now, horseshoe kidney and RIRS uh, can go along very well. Uh, it is because there is an angulation issue at times. So you need to make sure that uh, majority of these patients probably would be needing pre-stenting. So as a consequence, uh, they will be needing probably two procedures uh, first stenting so that you are have a nice roomy ureter so that your scope can go over the uh, bridge um, of the horseshoe kidney, the isthmus, and then be able to go into the desired calyx. So that's the only thing. Uh, otherwise, RIRS is a very much a possibility. I'm just interested in knowing that majority of uh, the residents are in favor of RIRS and not, not uh, in the favor of lithotripsy. So uh, why is that? Why not lithotripsy? I mean, what, what do you think would be the cone? So 
So we know that uh, because of the anatomical uh, distribution or anatomical abnormality, the stasis element in a uh, horseshoe kidney is more, and that's the reason why people with horseshoe kidney are more prone to develop uh, stones. So from that logic, uh, you know that if you are uh, doing lithotripsy, the clearance of these stones, particularly from the lower pole, because there is a very acute angle of the lower pole and the ureter. So if you go into these uh, horseshoe kidneys, you'll find the, the, the angle is quite acute. And as a consequence, the clearance from the lower pole calyx uh, down into the ureter is much more difficult than the normal anatomy kidney. So lithotripsy, uh, PCNL is a, is a pretty wonderful option. It's very good, straightforward access into these kidneys. Uh, whereas RIRS is a very good option for a small stone burden, lithotripsy with some reservations. Right. So uh, uh, when I had this question in my, in my mind, when the patient came to me, so I looked up to the literature and this is a systemic review with this very specific question uh, about uh, a comparison of the two treatment options in stones less than two centimeters in horseshoe kidney specifically. So as per this systemic review, uh, the success rates in terms of and the stone free clearance, it isn't much different between the URS and the shockwave lithotripsy. However, uh, uh, the shockwave lithotripsy is associated with more retreatment. Uh, that actually is the um, nature of the treatment as, uh, in itself. Uh, and there was no difference in, in uh, any uh, uh, rate of any complications between the two groups. However, the lithotripsy group had, uh, uh, the patient in the lithotripsy group, they had a more renal colic episodes. So if we uh, look specifically into the literature, so uh, uh, whatever we choose, either lithotripsy or URS, it does not really make much of the difference. But of course, we again have to decide based on on case to case basis. So uh, moving on to the next question. So if we consider lithotripsy as an option for whatever reason it is, so uh, should we pre-stent such cases with, with this uh, stone size? So the question is open for the residents. So uh, we have one opinion about uh, the, the stent should not be placed and we'll wait for and the other opinions as well. Similar, and I agree. Uh, that pre-stenting is not really required if you're going for lithotripsy because it's not going to help your clearance. Now, the only advantage of pre-stenting is that if you have significant stone burden, it would avoid uh, symptomatic Steinstrasse or ureteric obstruction. Uh, you are occluding the lumen uh, of a naive ureter with a stent, and that will actually hamper the clearance of the stone. So I agree that stenting is not required. Right. So uh, one, just one last question from this case and then I'll wrap up. So if we, for example, consider that the stone burden is high and we decide about doing a PCNL, so what would be the important considerations in, in this anatomic variant? Okay. So, yeah. And coming that upper pole puncture should be preferred. There are aberrant vessels. So looking at the CT scan is important. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, these, are, these are correct answers. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rana, uh, for uh, these two very nice cases, which have illustrated some important consideration when you are treating patient with the similar stone burden but various parts of the kidney and using the appropriate management option according to tailor it according to the patients. Thank so, you so much, sir. Honored to be a part of discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we move on to the uh, next part of our talk. And I'm sorry that we have uh, a bit of a delay in start. So uh, we move on to transplantation and uh, the first presentation is by Dr. Ayaz Khan, who is the head of the department in Shifa International Islamabad. And he is a, one of the leading transplant surgeons in Pakistan. And he's going to talk about com complex surgical situation in renal transplant surgery. And uh, the panel includes uh, Dr. Shahid Akil and Rehan Nasir Khan 
from AKU. Uh, both have significant transplant experience. So I'm sure you will enjoy this presentation. Dr. Ayaz Khan. Okay, Dr. Ayaz, you're ready with your presentation. You can share screen now. Uh, Sharif, can, can he be unmuted? Uh, is he mute? Ayaz, are you finding difficult to upload your presentation or say something? Okay, while uh, the Dr. Ayaz presentation is uploaded, uh, I will address a few questions. The, uh, the question from Dr. Nazesh is, sir, in the first case, why can't we perform ureteral lithotomy? Okay, so why can't we perform? So ureteral lithotomy is something which is becoming an obsolete procedure now, but you are right that if you either have an issue with the availability of endourological instruments. In that situation, urotolithotomy is an option. And the second situation is if for some reason, patient does not wish to have multiple surgical procedure, then there is an option of doing urotolithotomy. But urotolithotomy is, is becoming more of a, a, a dinosaur rather than the armamentarium for management of stones in 21st century. Okay, is there an issue with the Dr. Ayaz's presentation, Sharif? Hello, Dr. Hello. Yes. Uh, Dr. Shahid, is there any difficult with the AIs? So what we do, we switch over? I don't know. I'm trying to find out uh, if there is one that, are you ready with your presentation? No. We can do it your first and then subsequently yep. Dr. Ayaz can present. I agree. There is any delay? Yep. Yaz, is it okay that while you are uploading your presentation, we can start off with Dr. Shahid's presentation? Okay, so I think there is some issue with the uh, connection. Uh, can, Shahid, can you upload your presentation, please? Share a screen yeah. now. Yeah, share a screen. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Asif Shahzad uh, that uh, can we perform PCNL on both kidneys in one sitting? Well, bilateral PCNL is, is very well established surgical procedure and can definitely be performed. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, your operating time is not too prolonged. Uh, remember, majority of the time your patient is lying prone. So you need to consider the operating time as one of the limiting factors. So. Uh, uh, fine. Uh, the next is uh, Dr. Shahid Akil, uh, and he'll be talking about surgical complication of renal transplant. Please go ahead, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hamad, uh, giving me an opportunity to present in this forum. Uh, uh, this is a surgical complication of renal transplantation. So we just uh, uh, in the early era of the transplant, kidney transplantation, surgical complication was a major cause of graft loss. 
around in 1980s is about 20%. With the improvement of surgical technique, the frequency of these complications had dropped significantly. And currently, they estimated that the large transplant center is the percentage of post-surgical complication less than 5%. Post-transplant urological complication around 2.5 to 27% can cause a significant morbidity and mortality. So we divide the surgical complication. Uh, uh, wound is the major cause of complication in post-transplantation. Urological like urinary fistula, uretic obstruction, VOR. Uh, vascular is a, is a disaster, major complication for arterial and venous thrombosis, renal artery stenosis, lymphocele, hemorrhage, or we can uh, categorize either as an early intraoperative complication, immediate or late complication. So this illustrated diagram showing the two category of group, or oh, one is the immediate and early complication and some are the late complication for surgical transplant. You can see the topmost the bleeding, renal artery thrombosis, renal vein thrombosis, urinary leak, and some late complications uh, as a, uh, considering about renal artery stenosis, hydronephrosis due to compression of the uterus, other lymphocele. So we will talk about one by one in a little bit detail. So let's start with the wound complication. It's the most common complication of transplantation after kidney, that is about 5% incidence. A risk factor is similar as the other surgery, including the systemic factor, age, obesity, diabetic, wound features, operative characteristic, surgical technique, and intraoperative contamination. Uh, we categorize the wound infection as two groups, uh, like either is a superficial wound infection or is a deep. As a standard, is a uh, morbidity is uh, about uh, uh, within our surgery, post surgery, within 30 days. Uh, if you, infection is limited to the skin and subcutaneous tissue, pleural discharge from the superficial wound, sign symptom of infection, pain, tenderness. This is considered the superficial wound. In a dupe, the duration is same, pleural discharge from the deep incision, spontaneous adhesions, fever, pain, tender, and abscess or their own direct examination or by the radiological. So there is some other non-infectious condition. We talk about the infectious, some non-infectious condition, post-transplantation wound, some are the wound dehiscence, paragraph fluid plaction, and later on, incisional hernia. So we start with the urological complication. For example, this is the urinary fistula, about incident five to six percent. In generally, the most urinary leak as a result of uteric problem failure of the VUG, uh, uretic and ostomosis, or ischemia or necrosis. In most cases, there is a constant discharge of clear liquid through the drain is an immediate post-operative period. Unexplained graft dysfunction, pelvic fluid collection, fever, graft tenderness, lower limb edema can occur with this urinary fistula. Uh, in an early leak, we can divide it in a two types, like either in a first uh, four days, almost always related to the technical problem with the implantation. In this is cases, the ureter is pulled out of the tunnel caused by the excess tension of the anastomosis, or usually five to 10 days is associated with the distal uretic ischemia. So what is the Diagnosis, universal is easy diagnosis. Any doubtful case, a need to exclude the lymphocele. Fluid analysis showed that the elevated creatinine and ultrasound and renogram uh, is a treatment choice, but is the renal scan, nuclear scan is a more sensitive for the urinary fistula. Cystogram should be performed if the bladder leak is suspected. So here, this is a uh, unique uh, case of uh, uh, renogram. Uh, you can see this renogram shows that in the outline on the right side, there's a good outline of the kidney. And on the left side in the pelvic area, you see some uh, free fluid that's a urinary leak and the blow down there's a bladder. So after correction of this uh, uh, urine leak, 
uh, repeat scan shows there's a nicely odd time of the transplant kidney and the blood is or, uh, nicely fill out and there's a no leak. So treatment of the urinary fistula is if minimally extravasation of the ureteric reimplantation sites and clinically stable treatment by the urinary drainage is the best simple treatment. In case of unfavorable outcome after the clinical treatment, surgery is indicated. So we don't discuss here about surgery, either go minimally invasive, open surgery, depend upon if you early leak. So you have to, within a week, we have to go and reimplantation again. If you leak later, will be better later on. So endoscopy, you go for the scopy, uh, stenting or PCN insertion and later on stenting. So these are the stage-wise management according to situation. Uretic obstruction. In an early post of course, due to a uh, blood clot for a cause of obstruction, uretic malrotation, kinking during time of the implantation, tight submucal tunnel, and the perigraph fluid collection. So for resident point of view, if someone is a transplant, post-transplant, or day zero, day one, if you think about patient making urine and all of a sudden urine uh, stop, uh, so considering about these one blood clot, all these are the initial stage, you take a little bit saline, flush the catheter, sometimes a small clot is clear out and urine output is quite good. So start from the basic thing and think about later on accordingly. So in a later, in after first month or the air transplant, secondary to chronic ischemia, lead to fibrosis or an stricture. Uh, what is the symptom presentation? Pain over the surgical side, decreased urine output, oliguria lead to anuria, rise in blood pressure, secondary to impaired renal function. And diagnostic tool we have a shows that by gradual creatinine rise. Radiological ultrasound shows the hydronephrosis and hydroureter. Uh, nuclear scan is less sensitive in a transplant because the obstructive kidney impaired the uptake. Yes, if we unclear diagnosis, you can consider about anti-grade pilogram. So this is uh, for resident, this is uh, ultrasound transplant kidney. Uh, 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 can someone like an uh, idea about uh, is uh, in ultrasound, what is the finding? For resident? Please feel free to uh, share your comments about what is your, uh, okay. So uh, there is hydronephrosis. Uh, majority thinks that there is hydronephrosis of the yeah, transplant. Good. This, is a this is a post transplant picture shows there's a pelvic initial dilatation and the hydronephrosis. What about this? So proximal hydroureter. It's quite That's good. Opinion coming from the residents. Yeah, good. Is the hydronephrosis and leading to the little bit higher ureter. So uh, let's move to the lymphocele. Uh, this incidence about 0.6 to 16 percent is a common presentation. Uh, lymph collection from the ileic vessels uh, and lymphatic and accumulate between the transplant kidney and the bladder. If it's small collection, usually asymptomatic, but the large collection manifested few weeks to month. In severe cases, edema of the lower limb, ipsilateral of the graft, uretic compression leading to hydronophosis and loss of the graft uh, graf function. Uh, so how will you diagnose? Very simple. Uh, if you any collection fluid, send the fluid, take aspiration fluid and send for the fluid for creatinine. If, we, if the creatinine is normal, considering about lymphocele. Doppler ultrasound shows that hydronephrosis altered the vascular flow and quantified the lymphocele. And I consider the other collections such as like hematoma and uronoma as a differential diagnosis. So this is the ultrasound of the transplant kidney. Again, uh, uh, can someone guess about what is the finding?
So perinephric collection, uh, that's what the hyperdense, now you can't call it hyperdense on, uh, this is an ultrasound picture. So you should be talking about echogenicity. There is opinion about hematoma, perinephric collection. Right, Dr. Hamad. So we can see here that the uh, upper part over there is a kidney around surrounding of the peri uh, nephric, there's a large uh, collection, hematoma, heterogeneous appearance of that one, leading to the uh, diagnosis for hematoma. Uh, what about this resident? So parapelvic collection and uh, fullness or hydronephrosis of the system. Yes, very good. So fullness of the hydronephrosis, and there you see there's a an quick collection around the both side kidney. It looks like the uh, urine urinoma. So this is CT transplant kidney. What is the finding, resident? Can you can define someone? So this is a CT scan showing the Excel picture. Uh, there is a uh, outline of the bladder. You can see on there is a uh, transparent kidney on the uh, uh, the left side, and there is a collection bulging collection is there. And this is a showing for that was a, a homogeneous appearance. It looks like it's lymphocele. So treatment. Uh, treatment can be divided based uh, on the spectrum, puncture, drainage, or surgery. If a small volume of lymphocele is less than 40 mg, 140 mg, asymptomatic tend to be resolved spontaneously without any renal graft damage. If the volume is around large, around 500, punctured and drained by ultrasound or CT guided. If there is a recurrence, uh, and there's a, uh, a problematic, uh, the cell infocele, so considering about the sclerotherapy with the epiodine, iodine, 5% ethanol. In cases of refractive cases, then we consider about the laparoscopic or either open lymphocele fenestration that is called isomer supralization, is the procedure of choice in a recurrent refractive case of lymphocele. Recently reported the insertion of the 10 cough catheter at the site of lymphocytes allowing the intraperitoneal drainage. Uh, this is an article published in the uh, Urology Journal. It's a treatment of the recurrent symptomatic lymphocyte after kidney transplantation with intraperitoneal 10 cough catheter insertion. So in conclusion, the ultrasound guided interperitoneal drainage with the 10 cough catheter appear to be a simple daycare procedure, effective and safe method for treating a unilobular recurrent symptomatic lymphocele. In diagrammatic picture, you can see this is a 10 cough catheter, one end in the peritoneal cavity, one end uh, into the lymphocele area and is a, is a tunnel catheter is drainage for the high volume recurrent case of lymphocele. So let's move toward the vascular complication. Uh, is, a, is a nightmare for the transplant surgeon. It's a less than 10% of the cases of vascular complication. If you look, the percentage is less, but it's a disaster. Renal artery thrombosis is about 0 0.2 to 3.5%. Renal vein thrombosis is about 3%. Transplant renal artery stenosis is about varying is up to 23%. Uh, renal artery pseudoaneurysm is less than 1%. So renal artery thrombosis is the most worrisome complication and incidence about average is about 1%. Usually the technical difficulties in the removal of the organ or the implantation. Ineffectomy and perfusion injury may occur in the endothelial earlier fenestrating to the process of the, first, the thrombosis. An ostomosis of these small vessels or a very different size or twisting and bending pressure can lead to renal artery thrombosis. 
presentation, most common clinical presentation is a sudden onset of interruption of the urinary flow without pain in the graph. This is a hallmark feature of the urinary thrombosis. Immediate surgical exploration may allow in a few cases revascularization and recovery of the graph. But uh, uh, ground reality is that most common consequence end with the graft loss and nephrectomy in a renal artery thrombosis. But in a literature, they can save in a few cases. So this is a, a post-nephrectomy renal artery thrombosis. As you can see, the thrombosis is in the vessels, arterial vessels. Renal vein thrombosis is uncommon, but the serious complication using occurring in the first week after transplant and with a great potential for the graft loss. Transplant kidney does not have any collateral, collateral circulation, venous stasis, causes impairment of blood flow, consequent of loss of function. Complication lead to rupture of the graft, hemorrhage, hypovolemia, and uh, disaster with the circulatory shock. Presentation is a non-specific symptom, sudden onset of hematuria, oliguria, anuria, localized pain, and swelling of the graft. If you compare with the uh, renal vein thrombosis, renal artery thrombosis, there's a tenderness, pain is there. But can present with the ipsilateral lower limb DVT. Doppler ultrasound shows the renal volume, increase in size, and there's a no venous flow, increase the arterial reverse diastolic flow. Cases reported for early exploration and thrombectomy, but most commonly end up with the graft nephrectomy. So this is a post-nephrectomy for renal vein thrombosis. You can see the periphery, there is a change of and there's a venous area stasis and the thrombosis you can see here. But in a later, little bit late case, you can see graph rupture with thrombosis. So let's move toward uh, uh, renal artery stenosis. So prevalence about two to 10%, peak onset is about three to six months. Clinical features, refractory hypertension, declined renal function, and someone is started with the ACE inhibitor, so more decline the renal function. Doppler ultrasound shows increased blood flow velocity more than six kHz. Archiography is a still gold standard, showing the stenosis significant more than 50% if you human occlude. Recently, uh, gladonium enhanced MRI efficacy comparable with the art arteriography. Treatment, if you, conservative treatment, if you mild stenosis, BP is controlled, keratin is stable, conservative treatment. Invasive indication considering of uncontrolled blood pressure with the uh, multiple uh, uh, antihypertensive regime, worsening of creatinine, non-invasive tests such as that the progression of the stenosis, then you have considered about angioplasty, stenting, recommendation in localized stenosis, and a distance is uh, more than one centimeter from the anastomosis. So here are some pictures about uh, angio. You can see here the, uh, the renal uh, transplant angiography, and you can see the uh, narrowing of the lumen, then lead to stenosis, and that lumen stent is in place and the, uh, that lumen narrow segment is gone. So this is my last slides. Uh, 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 this is a tra renal transplant uh, artery false aneurysm. Uh, this uh, article published in uh, 2010 in OMJ. The case report, uh, interesting case is a 59 year old male commercial renal transplant non-related uh, living renal transplantation and stage renal disease secondary to polycystic kidney disease. Uh, early post-operative started with bleeding, managed conservatively, uh, referred in hospital uh, with four months of transplant, presentation with the pain, nausea, vomiting, uh, loss of appetite, and rise of creatinine. Radiological investigation started, ultrasound and angiography shows there is a four centimeter false aneurysm of the renal transplant artery at the site of the anastomosis with the external ileic artery. 
So we proceed with the surgical exploration, resection of the false aneurysm, re-anastomosis of the donor artery to the external ileic artery, and the uh, outcome is successfully to preserve the renal allograft. So this is a rare case with the extra renal false aneurysm uh, to anastomosis side in transcondylar artery activity. In the literature, there are a few cases report the uh, incidence is less than one person. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you, Shahid, uh, for a very well presented uh, cases. I think from the perspective of the resident, this really provides uh, very understandable uh, very good understanding of the whole situation. So, uh, Dr. Rehan, uh, do you want to make some comments about uh, yeah. what can be asked in the examination and to address some of the queries that the residents have raised? So I, okay, just to uh, you know, summarize what Dr. Shahid had, had already mentioned, what the residents should really focus on is that it's uh, the whole transplant process involves not only the prep, just the transplantation of the kidney, that means it would involve the vascular anastomosis, which is two anastomoses, which need to be considered, the vein and the artery, the ureteric anastomosis of how you place the ureter to the bladder. Apart from that, you have to keep in mind that complications can arise from the vascular bed, the renal bed formation and the wound closure and stuff like that. So a question which has been repeatedly been asking, asked in the uh, chat forum has been uh, about hernias, incisional hernias. And that could relate to the tissue tension, uh, you know, the tissue tension, and how the you close the uh, uh, you know abdomen at the end of surgery. Uh, apart from that, another question, how, which had been asked by some one of the residents, was how you would differentiate a lymphocele with urinoma. So keep in mind about two things. If, if you're looking at if, though both of these. Uh, diseases will present in a similar fashion as a collection around the kidney, you need to look at the bigger picture. How is the patient presenting to you? Has the patient's uh, urinary output dropped or not? If you're looking at a decreased urinary output with no significant hydronephrosis and a collection and a raise in the creatinine, it's likely that there was a urinary leak and it's being reabsorbed. So that's one issue that you would look into. If you're, not, if you're looking at just a collection, a large collection can cause ureteric obstruction. And in that case, there will be a raise of creatinine, but in lower, smaller, small, smaller size, you will not see a change in creatinine. So definitively, if you want to get a diagnosis, if it's a urinoma versus a lymphoma, you would go for a, um, an aspiration and sending that fluid for creatinine and DR. So that's another concept which needs to be made clear. Um, other than that, if there are any other questions, I'll just answer in the chat box. I believe okay. Uh, yeah, it's great. So thank you very much, Dr. Rehan, for your uh, valuable input. And uh, we are very fortunate that we have uh, Mr. Noor Bohols, which I can see now wearing a nice black kurta, I think. <laughs> and uh, Ayaz Khan and our president of PAUS, uh, Dr. Professor Atau Rehman. So welcome to all of you. Uh, Dr. Atta has raised his hand. Please uh, uh, give access to Dr. Atta to speak. And uh, Dr. Yasan is ready for his talk. So as soon as Dr. Atta has commented, we will uh, proceed with Professor Ayaz Khan's presentation. Yes, Dr. Atarahman. We can right, thank, you. thank you very much, Amat. Uh, I'm still the president-elect, not the president yet, <laughs> because the powers are there with the president. And I think uh, hopefully in the next couple of months, uh, I hope that things would be decided. Uh, I think you, you did ask for the question to the resident about what is expected in the exam. And I think in the transparent uh, patients, uh, I think what we expect them that how they can work up uh, the transplant patient, both donor and recipient. And secondly, uh, you don't go into the details really uh, how to operate on them. But one thing is how to uh, really make a diagnosis like a re renal dysfunction in the transplant. So how, what different thing they have to think about it. 
and when is the time when they have to refer it to the uh, transplant surgeon because uh, i feel that the transplant surgery now is a separate specialty and they are expected to basically just uh, make a decision when to refer it to the to the transplant surgeon and uh, everything is i think discussed in detail and prob i'm sure they must have picked up the points what they are expected to see thank you very much i think is Professor Ayaz is going to present his case. Yes, Dr. Ayaz Khan, please proceed. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Hamad, uh, for arranging this uh, marvelous activity. Uh, my topic for, to, uh, for today is like a complex renal surgery. But as Dr. Can you listen to me? I think. Yeah, we can hear you very well. Please yeah. go ahead. Right. So, as Dr. Atta said, basically, uh, this uh, workshop is for the uh, to prepare the residents for uh, FCPS2 exam. And uh, in my presentation, definitely my scenario is according to the, um, what do you call, um, your, uh, uh, you know, what, what is described in the, is like a complex case. But I would like to make it very simple for the residents and would like to cover those parts of the uh, transplant, which actually pertaining to the FCPS2 exam, basically. So this is my scenario, and I would like to have my whole presentation on this single scenario and covering most of the aspects. And if any problem, we can discuss it. So this is like a 30 years old gentleman with the hypertension and end-stage renal disease, uh, which presented uh, uh, for a transplant uh, evaluation. He has a history of 10 uh, fall, 10 years back, resulting in partial weakness and uh, loss of sensation over his limbs, but had uh, made progressive recovery and now can walk without support, you know. Uh, he has a history of pulmonary tuberculosis five years ago, been treated for that. Uh, he has, uh, he's now on maintenance hemodialysis for the last three years. And uh, he has multiple attempts of bilateral femoral and IJ uh, catheterization after failed uh, uh, arteriovenous fistula, and now he's been dialyzed on a permacath, right? So this, this things are you know, making the thing a bit more complex. His ultrasound shows minimal fullness of the left pelvic calicial system and moderate to right uh, hydronephrosis and hydroureter with thick wall bladder, and has bilateral uh, irregular renal contours and uh, mild uh, abdominal pelvic ascites. The other thing is that his 24 hours urine output is 700 ml and uh, 24 hours urinary proteins is seven grams, which is really a high protein uh, excretion. And he had a renal biopsy because one of his kidney was really not that much hydronephrotic, so somebody did his biopsy. And that showed the FSGS, you know, which is another cause of uh, failing kidneys. So that is, the, the scenario is a bit complex, but I, I think we, we are going to make it very simple. So how to proceed with this thing, right? Actually, I made this scenario because we have to cover all the aspects of a transplant patient uh, preoperatively. So in this patient, like there should be a detailed history uh, with a lot of emphasis on the lower urinary tract symptoms, basically, the genital urinary history and the neurological history that he has a history of uh, trauma. And a detailed physical examination and you know, neurological examination specifically to the nerves uh, he would definitely have an infectious disease consultation, a complete virology screening, and uh, work of for tuberculosis and other infections, including parasitic and sexually transmitted uh, on the history based. If there is any history, so you need to look into these infections as well. A complete assessment of the cardiovascular system, respiratory system, and uh, uh, a cancer screening according to his age and sex of the patient, male or female, like mammography or uh, screening for the colon cancer. Things must be done before transplantation. And uh, in this patient, assessment of the bladder and the upper tract, uh, including a non-contrast CT or widening cyst lithogram or uh, urodynamic studies. So these are various important aspects in this patient. And the other thing that he had multiple, uh, you know, failed attempts of the vascular accesses like femoral cats and IG cats. So definitely you would be expecting a complex vascular anatomy in this patient. Uh, like he might have like thrombose iliacs, iliac veins, you know, maybe the inferior IVC might be thrombose. So a complete assessment of the vasculature in this patient is important for the transplant. 
And another important thing is the baseline uh, ACR, uh, uh, albumin creatinine ratio is important in this patient pertaining to the, uh, mm, uh, pertaining to the um, uh, FSGS basically, because there's a high, heavy proteinuria and you must have a baseline uh, protein so to assess him postoperatively. So what immunological workup is needed in a transplant patient? You know, the first thing, the first thing is ABO grouping. So as all of you know, I mean, there should be, it should be the same group. And you know, the grouping for the transplant is the same as for the blood grouping. I mean, like there are universal donors, universal recipients as uh, for the blood uh, donation, uh, blood, uh, you know, transfusion. So same is for the uh, kidney transplant. Uh, but there's another thing, which is RH factor, like uh, a positive or a negative. So what do you think? Does it matter, the residents? Does it matter in transplant? Any, any, anybody would respond? Does it matter? So, yeah, it doesn't matter. Basically, it doesn't matter. And why it doesn't matter? Because it is only present on the RBCs, right? So this antigen is not present basically on the parenchyma endothelium of the, uh, of the graft. So, I mean, the donor, the recipient who's, will not develop antibodies to RH factor. So RH factor, if a B negative and a B positive, you know, can, you know, like uh, donate or receive a kidney from a, a different RH factor, but the grouping should be accordingly. Other immunological workup, like there should be HLA tissue typing uh, at the start. And uh, just before transplant, you need to do the uh, CDC cross match. Uh, then the flow cytometry, the Luminex, and sometimes the DSA, the donor-specific antigens are needed. And, uh, you know, like HLA matching is done once, say, but the rest of the things like the Luminex and the flow cytometry and the you know, cytotoxic cross match, they are, uh, it, it's better to have a repeated, you know, like at least twice should be done before the transplantation. Uh, in our uh, social, uh, you know, like setup, we, we 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 can't afford much of the testing in, in 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 especially because this is very expensive. But as the patient, we call it immunological history. So if you have a history, like a, a patient had a CDC positive, like say six months ago, so then you know we wait and you know then like say for example it, it is negative, this uh, cross match is negative, but even the history of the patient would uh, translate to the immunological reaction to the graft. Uh, the other is uh, like we will coming we'll be coming to the HLA and these things uh, separately. So what is uh, transplant desensitization and who need it? You know, transplant desensitization is actually done for those uh, recipients in whom the the donor they have antibodies towards the donor and uh, and and if they don't have unfortunately another donor available, right? So you desensitize these patients. And then you can transplant and, you know, then you have to repeat the Luminex, you have to repeat the flow cytometry and the cross match, and they have to be negative and ready for the transplantation. So desensitization is needed in, in, in sensitized patients and already sensitized patients. And the haplotype, you all know, I mean, the, 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 the HLA genes are trust, half of them comes from the father, half of them from the mother. So, you know, half if a patient is like, a, you know, a, a mother is donating to us, son or son is donating to a parent. So, I mean, they, they, they will have a haplotype at least, right? So, because half of them, half of the HLA would be coming. So, next. So, this is a, um, a, a, a simplest uh, a slide of the, C, what is CDC cross match? What is flow cytometry? What is Luminex? I'll make it very simple. The cytotoxic cross match, which basically detects the antibodies towards the HLA antigens of the donor. So you take the serum of the recipient, right? So the serum of the recipient would have antibodies and you take the lymphocytes from the donor, from the blood, right? So they are B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes and they are separated, right? And then you mix those lymphocytes with the serum and the serum contains serum of the recipient contains antibodies and you add on the complement you can see it's a complement so you add, and the reaction the classical pathway the reaction would take place 
So if there are antibodies against the B or the T lymphocytes, there will be lysis. As you see here, there will be lysis of the cells and it would mean that the crossmatch is positive, right? So if the crossmatch is positive, you don't go for transplant, simple. There's the flow cytometry. Flow cytometry is always the same thing, but it's a bit more, you know, like a very a sophisticated test. I mean, in, 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 same thing. I mean, you take the, sorry, you take the, the serum of the recipient and the lymphocytes of the donor, but actually this is done with a sophisticated machine and these antibodies are basically fluorescein labeled, right? IgG antibodies, where human IgG antibodies are labeled with fluorescein. And then, I mean, you mix this and, and then this mixture is passed to the flow cytometer. And if there, there are antibodies, right, against the specific antigens on the lymphocyte, they would attach to that and the flow cytometer, cytometer would read it like uh, with a laser detection that this, there, there's a, uh, there is a, uh, the, 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 uh, I mean, the, this would give a fluorescence and you will, uh, uh, and, and this will give some certain results that yes, there are, this is called a mean, this, they are described in a mean channel shift, right? So these also detect antibodies against the recipient. There is another test, which is called the Luminex test. So the Luminex test is basically a test in which actually the commercially prepared, there are commercially prepared uh, antigens, right? Which are uh, attached to, commercially available beads, you know, multiple hundred beads, see, and the antigens are attached and we know that which bead is, uh, which antigen atta is attached to which bead because the, 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 the beads have, a, you know, significant dye signature every, every bead and, uh, and they are admixed with the recipient serum, again, the same thing. And, uh, uh, and, and, and this, this is also called a virtual cross match. So all the antigens which are commercially available, whether they are, so it doesn't have the donor thing, right? So it's a commercially available beads and you have the HLA, HLA reading before in front of you. And then you see uh, uh, which antigen, commercially available antigen, which is matching with the HLA match of the donor, of the, you know, uh, of the recipient, you know, there is a reaction. So this is kind of a virtual cross match. And you can see uh, which antigen shows a uh, reaction, right? Uh, which, which antigen shows uh, antibodies uh, in the serum? Uh, the serum of the recipient have antibodies against that antigen. So these are different types of tests, basically. And these all tests actually complement each other. I mean, there are actually extreme details to these tests, why we do all these tests, you know? And still we are lagging uh, much behind in the immunology uh, throughout the world. Like, you know, still we have a lot of antigens which are not discovered, you know, a lot of problems that we have, like even these antigens which are, we have commercially available, that, that's not actually from our population. They are just like, we, like in our hospital, we, we have kids from the US. So they are from the population from US, right? See, so, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done on these uh, immunology things, but these are the simple tests that what we need to know is the CDC cross match, which is done like 48 hours ideally or within a week time of the transplant and it, definitely the flow cytometer and the Luminex and they all have to be negative. If, I mean, there is any doubt like in the Luminex, I mean, it shows that there are certain antibodies which are not detected. Uh, we can go for a single antigen B test. I mean, that you, you, you test every antigen of the um, um, the donor with the recipient that have uh, anti if the recipient has antibodies against any specific so that's called a DSA a donor specific antigen so you can go for those tests as well which is uh, called which is also a luminex test basically luminex based test so this is a CDC test and uh, uh, complement dependent cytotoxicity in which you take the serum of the recipient and the lymphocytes and you see that the T cell is negative and it is positive, uh, 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 the control is negative, but the T cell on the recipient serum is positive, right? And then you add on the DDT. DDT is a special thing. If you add on the DDT, if there are IgM anti antibodies, they destroy the IgM antibodies and the, the test become negative. So basically the IgG antibodies are very important in the transplant thing. You, you need not to go in much detail, but Basically, you need to know that 
CDC test is done for the IgG uh, for and the T lymphocytes and both B lymphocytes and both has to be negative. But if they detect low level IgM, they are not really very important most of the times. And then you go for a uh, flow cross match and the luminex screen as well. And if they are negative, you can straight away go for transplantation. This is a flow cytometry test, uh, which again is uh, the same antigen antibody um, test uh, with the fluorescence lab, uh, fluorescent labeled uh, antibodies against the IgG, against the T and B cells. And again, you see that there is a certain level of uh, antibodies present. And we take it like uh, there are certain like 60 we take for the T lymphocytes and 90 we take for the nine for the B lymphocytes. So if there is a high level of certain certain high level of antibodies against the Ig uh, against the uh, uh, B T lymphocytes or B lymphocytes like more than 60 for T is positive and more than 90 for B cell is positive. I mean it's a different uh, sure. Any, any question, please, somebody's? Yes, uh, Muhammad Islam, uh, so I want to say something. Uh, so this is a, a flow cytometry cross match, and then we, you see the uh, Luminex cross match. Again, you see that class one and class two, these are commercially prepared, all the antigens, they see all the antigens prepared, and then they see uh, antibodies in the, in the recipient against all the commercially available antigens, and then you match it with the, uh, specifically with the donor um, HLAs. All right, so these are the uh, immunological workup that you need to know, the CDC cross match, the flow cytometry, and the luminex screening. Uh, one thing more that in this patient, the FSGS, we, we discuss of the FSGS for focus. So the, actually the native, the disease for the native kidneys, I mean, the cause of the failure, like other than the diabetes and the hypertension, there are glomerulonephritis, nephritis, say for example, FSGS or the IgA nephropathy. I mean, these, there are certain diseases that would recur, recur in the donor. So we have to take into consideration and I have to have counsel the patient, like one third of the patient would have recurrence of FSGS in the donor uh, graft. So this is the same patient, I mean, uh, with the history of fall and the thick wall bladder and the gross hydronephrosis on right side and the minimal hydronephrosis on the left side, the VCG was done and the VCG shows like reflux on the right side. And uh, what if IgM is positive and IgG is negative? If IgM is positive, I mean, most of the time, actually IgGs are very important. Right, so if IgM is positive, you go for the Luminex screening. There is a question actually I'm answering there. Uh, there is a, uh, you go for the Luminex screening and you go for the flow cytomere. If they are clean negative, you can go for the transplant. But say for example, if, and sometimes the IgM are positive because of the autoantibodies. So you, you go for an auto cross match. You take the recipient serum and the recipient lymphocytes. And if the, you see that there is a cross match, it's a positive, so it means an auto cross match is positive. It's this, the, the recipient same antibodies against his own, so that, that doesn't uh, carry any importance. And sometimes it happens. And moreover, if there are IgM, you detect IgM antibodies with the addition of, as I told you, with the addition of DDT to the uh, cytotoxic cross match. Uh, uh, right. Actually, the presentation is a bit long, so I may not be following most of the questions. Anyhow, we can answer them at the end. Uh, Dr. Yaz, you can continue with your presentation because uh, Shahid and Rehan and Imran are, are responding to the questions. Okay, right. right. If there is anything left, we'll ask in there. Okay, fine. So, uh, so in this patient, like we have to have like a, uh, urodynamic studies as well. And uh, uh, we have to look into the, the cultures and everything. So what do you think, what should we do with this patient? I mean, urological point of view. Uh, what should we do with this? Should we go for the trust? Say if the immunological workup and everything is fine, uh, how we have to proceed with this uh, kind of uh, anatomy, urological anatomy in this patient. So, right, nephrotectomy, yes, we'll go for right nephrotectomy and 
would we go for the left nephrolytrectomy or not? I need blood augmentation before transplant. That's right, fine. Good answer. So we'll have to go for, uh, in, in this case, I would definitely go for a blood augmentation before transplantation. And I would definitely go for rather, uh, rather than unilateral, we'll go for bilateral uh, nephroyurethrectomy in this patient. And I, and I think that for going for the left nephroyurethrectomy is like I will take the advantage of having a big surgery midline incision. So definitely like I would like to take out the kidney. And the reason being for that is since this patient is having a heavy proteinuria in the case of FSGS. So post-transplantation, actually FSGS recurrence may happen anytime just after you start reperfusing the kidney. I mean, it can happen within days to weeks to months and years, you know, you never know. And definitely the start of FSGS is the proteinuria. So, I mean, if, if the patient has, in this case, his uh, native kidney, not in all FSGS, we take out the kidney, but yes, in this, I have a chance to take it out. So, I mean, I would uh, actually pick the uh, pathology very early in this patient, and I would like to take out both the kidneys. So, if there is proteinuria starting after the transplant, then definitely that is from the graft. So, augmentation, bilateral nephrotrectomy is with the matter of an off. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I agree with your plan because in this scenario, a uh, patient for the FSGS, uh, heavy protein urea, and one side is a, a cross head and fossil hydrator with a stomach of a, a small bladder. So, uh, considering a midline incision, uh, I'm, I agree with your plan to take out of the left kidney because of protein urea. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That, that actually, we, we no, no, because it is sometimes difficult. Yeah. So the other thing is like, in, since, since I have mentioned as well that we can have a baseline element creatine ratio and uh, all these things as well. But I mean, definitely uh, uh, picking the proteinuria is sometimes get, get confusing that, because you need to know if there is a start of proteinuria, just go straight away for the biopsy, you know? So the, the basic thing is you go for an early biopsy and early uh, addressing the FSGS in the graph here. Dr. Right. Ayas, would you, in this particular case, uh, would you consider going for a nephrectomy and augmentation with the ureter, native ureter? I don't think Using so. That? No. No. Because once the ureter, you can see the ureter is not that big enough. And the other thing is that, that you know, like I think the uh, routine augmentation with the small gut would be a better option. What do you think, uh, Shahid? Uh, like a different point, if he is a, a huge side dilated ureter, uh, then we take a, some advantage with the ureter uh, augmentation of the bladder because you know mucus production or depend upon is it just a reflex one or how, how much length of the uh, ureter it can usable or not. You can see, yeah, that, that actually the bladder is too small actually, and the ureter is not that big to to have a nice augmented augmented bladder. And more, what I mean, the uh, the, the ureter wall uh, is also damaged. Uh, what I mean, it's a disease as well, and damage if it is, for example, dilated even. So I don't think the uh, ureter yeah. wall would be uh, preferable as compared to the uh, bowel. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, so definitely, we are going to go for uh, augmentation in this and metrophenol, uh, and uh, then prepare the patient for the transplant. Yeah, you're right, Dr. Imran. So uh, the question here comes is like, what are the, what are the indications for the pre-transplant native nephrectomies? So one, one is this, this scenario, like, you know, I mean, there's a gross hydronephrosis, not always gross hydronephrosis, but if it's a high pressure bladder and high proteinuria, so in this case, we are going. What are the other indications of pre-transplant nephrectomies, which, which can be a common question in the exam? So, recurrent UTIs due to VUR, yes. Definitely, and heavy proteinuria, not every proteinuria, and not necessarily that we go for, sometimes you go for uh, medical ablation, uh, you know, of these uh, native kidneys, like taking, using endomethacine, just, just make them anuric and, you know, then you go for transplant. 
So, uh, but yes, heavy proteinuria is one of the, and the recurrent UTI is renal tumors, stones with non-functioning kidneys, secondary, yes, secondary to stones, or refluxing kidneys. So yes, these are the, uh, and, and one more important thing is the adult polycystic kidneys, right? Polycystic kidneys, so huge kidneys you take out. And the other thing is the secondary, you know, like uh, the patient who, who, who develop uh, cysts being on dialysis, they are also prone to uh, develop tumors. So in, in those patients who develop uh, uh, cysts in the kidney being on dialysis, acquired polycystic, uh, acquired cystic disease on dialysis. So uh, you, uh, it's better to go for nephrectomies in those patients as well. So uh, this would be... So highlight here, we are right uh, because the uh, mentioned indication of the uh, native nephrectomy uh, in the resident in chat box uh, mentioned is quite good. Uh, but uh, just clear about uh, here, uh, polycystic kidney important because uh, sometimes resident or junior thinking about every polycystic kidney go for native nephrectomy pre transplant is not. Only the, if, we, if we polycystic kidney disease is a quite big patient have a quality life uh, compromise, recurrent hospital admission for the infection, gross hematuria, transfusion. These are the indication for polycystic kidney uh, uh, removal for native kidney. If, if someone is a polycystic kidney, these are not huge. There's a, a space, good space for the transplantation, no infection, then not necessary to go for uh, native nephrectomy. Thank you. You're right. Very right. So actually, not not in every patient, polycystic kidney disease. Only in those in, in whom in Dr. Shai just has mentioned the indications. So, uh, and and so is the VUR. Right? Like in every VUR, you do, don't go for. If the patient has a history of recurring UTIs and you think that the patient might have a problem after the transplant, so in those patients you go for the. Um, uh, uh, for for uh, nephroeurotractomies. One thing that I would like to share, like if you're going for a nephroeurotractomy in a patient with a VUR, what I I think are uh, uh, that you, you you definitely take out the whole ureter up to the bladder, right? So what I do, like we do mostly laparoscopically, so you take out the whole ureter, like the left one up to the bladder, but I leave the right ureter most of the times, right? And just go below the kidney and leave the rest of the ureter. The reason being for that, that when going for transplant, when you have a next peritoneal dissection, you have a nice plane, then you can take out that ureter later on as well. So this is just one additional technical point that I would like to share. Uh, uh, what intervention required for the non-compliant bladder? If required, should be done of pre and post -trans? yes, pre-transplant. And when the patient becomes stable, you keep the bladder on a regular wash and keep the good capacity, and then you go for transplant. Uh, okay, does ureteric reimplantation differ for, for recipient with conduits or augmented bladder? Yes, it's the same thing most almost, but I mean, like in, in like in augmented bladder, you transplant the ureter, uh, implant the uh, graft ureter into the detrusor part of the native bladder, right? So that uh, uh, there should be no, and in the conduits, you basically keep the kidney, you know, rotated upwards. So the ureter is facing the kidney. Uh, the, 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 sorry, the conduit. So uh, does you, then you go for a, just, uh, you don't need to have like uh, in the conduit, you don't have to have an anti-reflux mechanism. So you just get stored straight away, you just implant the ureter. Well, uh, what about the difficult vascular anatomy of the recipient? I mean, as we already mentioned that he had multiple attempts of catheterization in the femoral. So yes, these patients like difficult vascularity in patients uh, you may face. Uh, Preoperatively, you may have, sometimes you pick it on the table. I mean, like sometimes the iliacs are completely thrombosed, and sometimes even the lower IVC is gone. When you open the patient, you don't see any vein to, you know. And there is sometimes problem with the arteries, and mostly in the diabetics, they are very atherosclerotic. These are very, you know, like uh, rotten kind of sick arteries, vas vasculature, and you have to be very careful, like making an arteriotomy because you can just, um, you know. Uh, um, um, you know, damage the entema and there is a, you know, like can lead to thrombosis later on. And so about the veins, I mean, if there's a difficult anatomy, you can keep the kidney a bit higher, like in the common iliac, common iliac artery, or even you can go up to the lower um, 
uh, you can go into the aorta and onto the IVC. Sometimes you need to do the orthotopic uh, transplantation, which is like you place the kidney in the retroperitoneum. And sometimes, like you, 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 you might, you know, come or in a, a situation like um, you have to, um, like we have done one case of uh, one one child that we, we did it with the native renal vein, you know. So sometimes there's really very difficult anatomy uh in in these patients and, uh, and definitely you have to decide there and then and uh, and you have to work up uh, these patients beforehand if you suspect anything like um, you you can go for a doctor studies of the abdomen you can go for an mri uh, to see this you can go for a ct venogram in these cases uh if there is any issue if there's any questionable uh, you know the range in vascular anatomy these recipients so yes, uh, and the other thing is that does uh, his history of permanent TB change his post-op care? Is another thing? This was another point. Yes, yes, a little bit here for the vascular anatomy of the recipient, because uh, uh, you know uh, this uh, pre-transplant work uh, mostly the nephrologists are involved, and there is a little bit, a uh, little bit uh, some uh, uh, mindset people are here because if a patient on diabetic, long-standing diabetic, so we are routinely do for the uh, CT uh, abdomen, uh, yeah. like uh, CT like KVUB to just yeah. see the uh, atherosclerosis, uh, the target, yeah. you know, how much is there. But th yeah. there's a new role for the contrast CT because some are thinking about their advice to do for the contrast CT. So just to clarify here, if you the patient diabetic, long-standing atherosclerosis, plain CT, it's yeah. good to give the anatomy. Yeah, if, normally, normally you don't need you don't need. Actually, that depends on the uh, uh, on the requirement. You are very much right, Shai. Normally, you don't need to go for a venography, in this, but there are certain patients. Like we had a patient, and if uh, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, make a slide of that. But sometimes, yes, you, you get really a very different anatomy. There is no IVC. There is there are no ileal queens in these patients, and they're all fibrosed. They're draining through the lumbers, and the, you know. So uh, yes, in those patients, you, you need to go for the venograms and these things. Mostly the CT, the plain uh, CT, as Dr. Shai pointed out, is uh, is is as a, uh, is a, is, is uh, okay in these patients. And 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 as far as we are concerned, and Shifa, actually, we are doing uh, plain CT in every recipient. <laughs> I mean, this is our protocol. Uh, and the reason being for that is like when we see uh, uh, any atherosclerosis, I mean, we, we can find out those things as well, if yeah, there is any atherosclerosis. And yeah. other thing, like we have, a, we had a patient actually before, sorry for this, that actually he had primary hyperoxaluria actually, and that could not be picked preoperatively. I mean, that was long ago that happened, but I mean, sometimes these things happens to you and then you are in a problem. And because that patient didn't have any stone, the ultrasound was done and just echogenic kidneys, you know, as normal you would see. And his graft failed after just a month. And, you know, when we saw it, there were stones. And you know, we did the biopsy and you could see auxiliary crystals. So, I mean, the CT, which what we do actually, what we have aided on is the non-contrast CT and then there is the light chains uh, to rule out myelomas. Uh, mm -hmm. multiple myelomas because there are certain patients who have failure to this so there are right. additional points As, uh, that's the reason i raised point because uh, uh, what we seen here like uh, in the transplant the pre-transplant work uh, mostly the nephrologists are involved but yeah. one the stage for the decision of the recipient vasculature or donor so the transplant surgeon should be involved that is a transplant surgeon decision to go for without CT, with CT, that's a part. It's not job for the nephrology. Yeah. Dr. Hamad? Yes, uh, uh, I was just, uh, it's a wonderful presentation. I think you're covering uh, every aspect. We're just running short of time. So if uh, I would. I'm request... almost done. I'm yes. almost done, Dr. Hamad. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think I'm almost done. So let me go to another slide if I have. Uh, I mean, these are just the few CTs. I mean, you can see the polycystic kidneys and the CT with the non-functioning just for the donor nephrectomies. And this is a CT of the primary hyperoxaluria. You can see the shining kidneys in these patients. So you, if you see any kind of a kidney like this, you go have to go for a workup of the hyperoxaluria, AGXT levels, and definitely this patient is going to need uh, combined liver and kidney transplantation. Great, uh, Ayaz, I think very comprehensively covered uh, and Shahid, 
uh, both the pre-transplant, uh, peritransplant, and uh, post-transplant issues. So I think as a surgical resident, this is exactly what you need to know. And so the whole syllabus is covered by these two wonderful presentations. Right, uh, so thank you to the panel uh, led by Dr. Ayaz Khan, Dr. Shahid, Dr. Rehan, and Imran Jalbani. Uh, and uh, now we move on to urolithiasis and uh, who is a better person to talk about urolithiasis than Mr. Buchholz. Uh, floor is yours, sir. So Dr. Buchholz is going to take you through some scenarios and the panel is Dr. Razuddin Bayabani from AKU and Dr. Atta Khan from Peshawar. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Waalaikum salam. Salam and waalaikum salam. Good. Oh, you? good. You can actually hear me. Good. Can you see yeah. my screen? Yes. And your picture as well. Okay. Good. <laughs> it's a dark blue quarter, by the way. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you very well. Please go ahead. Oh, okay. So. We make this a bit of an interactive session. Um, I will present a few cases and ask a few questions. And um, in this case, the audience will give the answers. Uh, I think we have a voting system in place. So let's start with some nightmare cases. So I have no disclosures. The first case is a 44 year old female post right nephrectomy for non-functioning stone bearing kidney four years ago. So she has a left kidney only. And in that kidney, she had six months ago, a left flexible ureteroscopy. And this is how I saw her first. So the left kidney has a lower pole stone and some little middle pole stone or parenchymal stones rather. So what therapy would you recommend? ESWL, PCNL, mini PCNL, or URS? So please vote now. Okay, how do I see when the vote is finished? Ah, oh, 30 seconds, good. So, what we actually did, can we close the poll? Yeah, what we actually, actually did, because this was the area before mini PCNL, we did a flexible ureteroscopy. Uh, we used an excess sheath. We used a wonderful new pressure device, which provided us with an excellent view. So there was no problem with the view and we put a double J stent after an uneventful flexible ureteroscopy. So then the patient went to recovery, the pulse went up, the blood pressure went down. She developed a right bundle branch block felt acutely unwell when she woke up with pain in the left loin area and no hematuria. So the next vote would be, what would you do in the recovery? Ultrasound, a CT, a max 3 scan or retrograde studies? Okay, so that's interesting. Um, 
Now, if it comes to CT scan or MAX3 scan, or even retrograde studies, that's not so easy from recovery. Um, we need a quick decision because patient is obviously going into shock, the blood pressure is going down, the pulse is going up. So ultrasound would be the first quick uh, means of orientation here. No, where are we now? But when the CT, when, when, when the ultrasound, no, we are, sorry, sorry about that. So the ultrasound showed there was some fluid collection. So we actually rushed the patient to a CT scan in a second step. And the CT showed this. So it showed a large hematoma around the kidney, actively bleeding with an upper pole rupture of that single kidney. So you have an actively bleeding single kidney. What do we do? Fluids, antibiotics, a renal angiogram, or all of it? Patient is going into shock. Good, so correct answer would be all of the above. Um, you need to give fluids for the shock, you need to anti give antibiotics for the hematoma and, you, and uh, you know, the, the open connection with the urinary tract and you need to quickly do an, uh, a, an, anti, uh, an angiogram to see where does the bleeding come from. So this is the angiogram. As you can see, there is an active bleeder and the patient was then rushed to the, to the interventional radiology and a selective embolization was done. But that was unfortunately not the end of it. The patient went to the ITU. She had by that time a full septic shock. So hence, you know, coming back to the antibiotics, she developed a multi-organ failure um, she had a renal failure and needed several times dialysis. Um, she had in total five cardiac arrests, needed a pacemaker. Then she developed a pariato-occitable uh, stroke with a left hemiparesis, a respiratory infection, and last but not least, a dental infection. Now, after one month, the hematoma has consolidated and there was still a small parenchymal stone and believe it or not she made a full recovery after these two, two months the kidney function completely normalized the double j could be removed and the only thing that will remind her of us will be a small persisting paresthesia of her left finger tip of one finger of the left hand. So the take home message from this case is this was an uncomplicated, flexible ureteroscopy, piece of cake, nothing went wrong until she get, went into recovery. Now think the unlikely, you know, think outside the box. Don't think nothing went wrong. What could it be? Can't be anything get independent input, ask colleagues early what is happening, and be careful with pressure devices, such as the one on the right side, which is a wonderful device, but my assistant was a little bit over enthusiastic and basically blasted the kidney. So case two, a 20 year old male with a right centimeter a right three centimeter renal pelvic stone with moderate hydronephrosis. He had previous right URS and a double J stent in another hospital. So a three centimeter stone, double J in situ, 
failed URS, what is your therapy? Okay, so we would all agree with the three centimeter stone, it should be some form of percutaneous uh, surgery. Um, mini PCNL is not in all hands as yet. Um, some propagator of mini PCNLs would say that the stone, stone limit should be two centimeter to be efficient and uh, swift and successful. Of course, there are experts who do nothing else than mini PCNL. They will be dealing with this stone efficiently with a mini PCNL, but this may be a good case, in my opinion, for a standard PCNL. So the patient got a spinal anesthesia. The double J was removed. The PCNL was done in the prone position. The puncture was done through a posterior calyx, which is nothing special so far. There was a little oozing, which was tamponated by the amplats, and a pneumatic lithotripsy was used. So, so far it sounds like a box standard PCNL. However, the surgeon noticed after fragmentation that there were very few fragments in the kidney as compared to a three centimeter stone. And then he noticed some fragments outside the kidney alongside the sheath on the image intensifier. And on final inspection, the kidney itself was stone free. So what do we do with those fragments outside the kidney now? We retrieve them from outside the kidney. We put a double J stent, we put a nephrostomy, or we do B and C. Okay, so since obviously there is something wrong with the excess and the stones could easily go alongside the amplets outside the kidney, we need an optimal drainage of that kidney postoperatively. So an optimal drainage means we should drain through the ureter with a double G stint as well as a nephrostomy for a few days. Now, as far as the fragments in the kidney are concerned, uh, outside the kidney are concerned, do not chase these fragments. They don't do any harm in the retroperitoneum. Um, and if you chase them, you may do some more harm rather than benefit the patient. However, what is very important is to inform the patient about this. So actually, the attempt to recover some fragments from outside the kidney was abandoned, fortunately. Um, we did the optimal drainage as discussed. Um, there was a difficult double J insertion as the resident retracted the guide wire into the lower ureter inadvertently. Um, this is real life. Um, so the patient had to be turned into the lithotropy position to put the double J stand in. Now then, uh, the patient developed in the recovery post-operative severe abdominal distension, a rigid abdomen, profuse sweating, so far no hemodynamic changes, no dyspnea, but, but a mild toe cyanosis and a mild erection. No, you may think that is not a bad thing, but maybe not in recovery. So what is your vote? What is the diagnosis? It's a renal colic. It's wet dreams and a Raynaud's syndrome. It's an intraperitoneal extravasation or it's a retroperitoneal extravasation. So please vote on the first one.
I can't see any votes coming in. Okay, I can't see any anybody has has anybody voted on this. It's all zero zero. Anyway, we go on. So this is an intraperitoneal extravasation. Now you may say, how can that be intraperitoneal if we do a retroperitoneal access? Well, either there are two possibilities: either during the operation, the um, retroperitoneal, there was a hole in the peritoneum. Um, maybe the surgeon went shortly out on the on the anterior aspect of the kidney. Maybe whilst they were looking for these uh, fragments, uh, they injured the peritoneum. Sometimes I've seen it if the fluid is massive, then the retroperitoneal space simply bursts and empties itself into the intraperitoneal cavity. So now that has happened. Um, so what do we do? Remember, toe cyanosis, erection, rigid abdomen. So do we give antiandrogens? Do we do a CT with contrast? Do we do an ultrasound? Do we do a max rescan? scan? Oh, okay. So for the first question now, I can see the results. That was intraperitoneal extravasation. Very good. And Yes, we should probably have a CT scan, but for quick orientation, we should have an ultrasound. Same like in the other case where I just mentioned it. Ultrasound is quick at hand. Uh, urologists should be able to do a basic ultrasound uh, of the kidneys, of the bladder, uh, recognize some fluid in the, in the abdomen, things like that. So the ultrasound then showed indeed a large amount of free fluid in the peritoneal cavity. So knowing that, what would you do? Give Lasix, restrict fluids for one week, put a drain into the peritoneum or none of it? Okay, the poll, poll is still going on. I don't know why, so maybe I can end it. No, I can't. Anyway, I close it now. Something is not quite right with the polling system, at least how it appears on my screen. Okay. So a large amount of fluid with secondary compression of the large blood vessels, which leads then to erection and blue toes, certainly requires deobstruction and uh, emptying with the intraperitoneal drain, which doesn't need open surgery or anything like that. It could be inserted. If you have a good radiologist, they can do that uh, uh, ultrasound guided. So 10 French a drain was put in and it drained indeed two and a half liters of clear fluid. The abdomen immediately softened and the cyanos, uh, the blue toes and the erection immediately resolved. So after two days, his creatinine, which has crept up to 1.9, went back to 0 0.9. Initially, as you would expect, the patient was poorly uric. He had a mild dyspnea, uh, for a few days, uh, but the aspiration of the pleura was dry, so it was just an atelectasis. There was no fluid in the lungs, and he was discharged on day four. 
Now, this is the CT scan one month after the operation, right? Concentrate on the right kidney, lower pole. So, what would be your next step now after one month? Retroperitoneoscopy. Hold on, I can't see it now. Retroperitoneal to retrieve the extra renal stones. Extra renal PCNL with transparent sheath to retrieve the stones. Lumbotomy and removal of the stones or inform and reassure the patient. So please vote. Okay, so the majority said inform and reassure the patient. But there's still like one third of you who would do an aggressive approach, either with a percutaneous or even with an open lumbotomy to get these stones out. Now, as I said before, these stones usually don't give any complications. But what you do need to do is to inform the patient about it, not so that the next urologist who sees on an x-ray these stones says, oh, we have to do something about it, right? So these stones are harmless as long as they stay in the retroperitoneum and usually you, they don't warrant any aggressive therapy. Good. Um, I will just go and open another screen you allow me? Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet, uh, no. Ah, okay, just hold on. Struggling with the, with the zoom as usual. Okay, share screen. Right, uh, meanwhile, do, uh, Dr. Bocholz are uploading his slides. Uh, Dr. Razi or Dr. Atha, any comments so far? So, I just wanted to ask, do you always use um, a, a pressure device and what sort of pressure you use during RI? Well, usually, I, usually, I usually don't. You know, there was a rep coming in and saying this is a wonderful device okay. and we used it and I was very impressed with the view. Right. Um, so, I don't, I, I don't think we, we monitored the pressure properly and we, we simply overdid it. Okay. Um, and I, this case illustrates very nicely that uh, you know you need to be very careful with, with all aspects of even simple operations. Right. And the, the recommended pressure, I mean, I usually hang up the, the I, I just use gravity. And if I really need some pressure, then I ask somebody to just uh, push a bit on the back, right? Um, if we do a pressure back, then usually we will not go over 200 millimeters HG. Okay, but I, I have a problem now with the sharing. With the sharing. Do, you want, do you want us to share your presentation? We have. Oh. This is a nice one. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> do you see anything? Can you see my screen? Yes. You see, James Bond. This was the this was the golden oh. era. Okay, so so now you see the presentation. Yes. Yes. Oh, very good. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, this was a, a very interesting case of intraperitoneal uh, leakage, yes. and I think uh, if anybody is doing PCNL postoperatively, I think he has to have in mind uh, because. It may not be always uh, interperitoneal leak. It can be a bleed as well. So yeah. Yeah, particularly if you see it going to other way, like patient is going to shock, dropping hemoglobin, yeah. 
and uh, if you are not heading, handling this properly, there could be a vascular injury. So I think one has to be prepared to really uh, deal uh, as per uh, what I mean, pathology. But I think intraperitoneal leak leakage should be sorted uh, very uh, meticulously. No, you are absolutely and also, right. Also, uh, uh, maybe uh, we should caution our uh, younger colleagues yeah. that uh, this patient requires very close follow-up. And yeah. if, uh, you know, uh, so just uh, relegating the case to the uh, interventional radiologist uh, yeah. is not that simple. You might want yeah. to yeah. closely observe and then the, the patient may require a laparotomy if it's not yeah. settling down. Yeah. And Noor, what I mean, you as you said, what I mean, uh, that people are not doing much of the mini PC analysis. Uh, is a main group is doing standard PCN. But I feel what I mean, the mini PCN. Well, I'm doing my all cases mini PCN and supine, and I, I feel that with mini, uh, uh, I've gone from like for a patient requiring a blood transfusion or loss of blood is really remarkably decreased in mini PCNL cases. And uh, I think uh, people should go on to uh, doing mini PCNLs as it, you can clear the stone as we do with the standard PCNL. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, what I meant is that the technique is not widely uh, uh, spread as yet. Yeah, yeah. But of course, those people who do a lot of it, they mm -hmm. will also do bigger stones very well with exactly, it. Exactly. Right. So for people who don't do a lot of it, if you do the occasional one, then you're better off not to go over two centimeters okay. or if you're a starter. Exactly. Good. So let's start with a, with a few more cases. So this is a 34 year old man. He has several large residual stones after previous open surgery. You can see the stones on the right kidney. He has a heavily encrusted JJ stand. I think you can, even on this picture, you can see that there is encrustation on both coils. And there was also encrustation all along the shaft. Um, now he has what we call a coralliform calicyl system. This means um, he has a very small renal pelvis and the calices are going in all directions off making it very difficult from, to go from one calyx into another uh, through one excess. Um, so the next step for this patient, so we have the heavily encrusted double gist in and we have these uh, complex stone burden with uh, several stones in, in several calyces. So we can do either uh, S ESWL on the proximal coil, we can do systolithal apaxy on the distal coil, or we can do a PCNL, or we can do all of it. Okay, so most of you say all of the above. That's exactly what we did. Uh, so the rest said ESWL, URS, PCNL, which is part of the whole thing. So this is a typical case where you need a well-equipped endourology unit with all the options. Um, so you, we did a ESWL to um, free the upper coil. We did a systolithal apoxy to free the lower coil. And then we did a PCNL. And if you find that with the PCNL, you cannot remove the double J stand because of encrustations alongside the shaft, then you might at the same time do a URS, either retrograde or anterograde or both, and free the long part of the double J stand of encrustations as well. Now, in this case, when we did the PCNL, you see the coralliform system here. There's barely any um, renal pelvis. Now this is a case, it's an old case. It's before we had flexible ureteroscopy. So the point I'm making is um, before you start your procedure, you may want to lay several guide wires in anticipation of several tracts. 
So that's number three and number four. So we did actually in this case, four guide wires in all the calyces and we only used two. So we got the patient stone free and the stand out with two excesses. Uh, however, puncturing the kidney with a needle, putting a wire down doesn't harm the kidney. It will be very difficult once you have your umplots in, you can't fill the kidney anymore to lay more excesses. So plan properly from the beginning. Case number two. Nope. Now this is a 31 year old female with spina bifida, as you can see. She also has uh, risk factors like sleep apnea, multiple comorbidities, and she has recurrent severe urinary tract infections. And I believe you can see the stone on the left side. Yes, you can see the stone. I don't know if you can see my arrow. This is the stone. And she has infections. Yes, we can. Good. So what is the therapy? Long-term antibiotics, chemolysis, a MAX3 scan, or a bedside ultrasound left flank. Not therapy, the first step now. So long-term antibiotics and send her home. Chemolysis, a MAX3 scan, or bedside ultrasound of the left flank. Okay, so most of you would do a bedside ultrasound of the left flank. Now, of course, it would be very convenient if such patients could be just sent home with antibiotics and that works, but usually it doesn't work and these patients will come back to you. Chemolysis, now this was a heavily calcified stone. Chemolysis will only work in uric acid stones and those you would not have seen on an X-ray. So chemolysis, without knowing what kind of stone that is, is a contraindicated. A MAX3 scan would be helpful if you want to know if that kidney is still working. Yeah, that's true. But why do we do the bedside ultrasound on the left flank? The simple reason is that we want to know whether we have an access through that flank. Because if you remember that X-ray, if the stone, maybe I can go back actually, if the stone were here, on the right kidney, there's the ribs touching the pelvic bone, no extra peritoneal, uh, no extra uh, percutaneous access would be possible here. Not at all. Fortunately, she had the stone on the open side. And that brings me to the next question. What would you do? ESWL, flexible URS, PCNL or open nephron lithotomy? Good, so most of you would do a flexible URS. I find that quite daring because these patients usually, I mean, this, this, this patient was one by one by one meter, right? Dimensions, outer dimensions. So these patients usually have very tortuous ureters. If you're lucky, you may get into that kidney, but keep in mind, it's an infectious stone. You blast that stone, but where will the fragments go? They will not come out from that tortuous ureter and that anormal kidney. So you need, and the same is true for ESWL. So you need to choose a method where you can at least try to get the patient completely stone free because that's the aim with infectious stones. Um, so of course, if you can, you do a PCNL 
or otherwise an open nephrol lithotomy would be another option. So we did a PCNL. We did it actually in a high spinal because of her risk factors. So you put the patient, when you put in the spinal on the contralateral side and you, um, this pull thing keeps cropping up here. Um, and, oh, why is it popping up all the time? So, um, and you use a, a, a heavy, but the anesthetist will tell you that you use a, a heavy uh, anesthetics drug um, that actually layers down on that side. Um, of course, you need an ITU, you need a very experienced anesthetist, and this should be done in a tertiary center because of the risk factors of the patient. Now, you have to simply to believe me, this is an ultrasound, you don't see anything, and that's exactly what it is. In that kidney, there's nothing. So the patient actually became stone free. Now, this is a 20 year old female. As you can see, this is a right stacon stone with some smaller stones around it. She has a good renal function. What should we do? Micro PCNL, mini PCNL, full PCNL, or flexible URS? Oh, there is uh, one person doing a flexible URS on a four centimeter stack on stone. That's quite daring. Your chances to do this in one session is almost zero. That's um, a Pakistani Oliver track, sir. Yeah. <laughs> and the mini PCNL, yes, we discussed it before. If you do all your cases in mini PCNL and you are very experienced, then you might. Uh, try to climb the Mount Everest with an ice pick. Um, it will take you some time, but this is a typical case for a standard PCNL, I would say. Even if I had the mini PCNL, I wouldn't try it. But, you know, as I say, if you're good at something, then it's not wrong. So, we did the PCNL, and again, we had, the, as you can see there, we had this problem that we debulked actually the stack on stone, but we had stones left in all the calices, and all these calices were in a way that we could not access them without making multiple tracts. So we put an anterograde stand in. Now the problem with this patient was she had a baby. She didn't want to come to the hospital as an inpatient anymore. And she wanted something non-invasive done. The calcium, the, the stone analysis showed it's a relatively hard stone. It's a calcium oxalate phosphate stone. So can we do chemolysis? Should we just wait and watch in this situation? Should we use forced diuresis or should we try ESWL? No, so the reason that you have not kept uh, redo PCNL is because she doesn't want to get into the hospital? Yeah, she didn't want another PCNL. Of course, the obvious thing would be to do another PCNL, right? So two people would do chemolysis. Now, chemolysis in a calcium phosphate stone, good luck. 
you can do it, but it won't do much good to the patient. It won't work. Um, wait and watch. She wanted something done, but she didn't want something done invasively and with hospitalization. So yes, the majority of you have voted for ESWL, and I think that is probably the only option in that scenario. So we offered her ESWL, although it is a slightly hard stone. So we made a slow but steady progress with several sessions of ESWL. Then she developed, you, you see that the stone slowly gets less in the kidney, but she developed Steinstrasse in the upper and lower part of the ureter, as you can see where the arrows are. So if you have a Steinstrasse, there are actually guidelines on this. What should you do with the Steinstrasse? URS, forced diuresis, laparoscopy, or ESWL? And keeping in mind, keeping in mind, this patient doesn't want to come to a hospital and have anything invasive done. Yeah, so most of you would get the ureteroscope out and try to shoot these stones. Now, the, the EAU guidelines say clearly if you have a Steinstrasse, you try another ESWL on the leading fragment because a Steinstrasse is a Steinstrasse because it's a traffic jam and usually where this traffic jam starts, there is an idiot and that idiot needs to be shot. So you can do that with the URS, but you can also do that with a ESWL. So sometimes or mostly when you crack the first slow going idiot, then the rest will follow. So it takes one to create a jam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As we all know in Dubai and uh, Karachi uh, very well <laughs> and in other big cities. <laughs> okay, now the patient had 14 shockwaves over one year, so roughly one every month. And believe it or not, she became stone free. So these are unusual cases. Uh, it's not your uh, standard off the shelf case. So you have to think sometimes out of the box, custom tailor the treatment and it does work. Sometimes it doesn't work, but you know, if you don't try, you will never know. Good, uh, the next woman, 78 years old, morbidly obese with a lot of comorbidities and recurrent urinary tract infection. And you can see here, there is a partial stack on stone in the left lower pole, as well as in the upper pole of the left kidney. So you've seen the X-ray. What is your next step? An ultrasound, an isotope scan, an IVU or CT IVU or B and C? Okay, so most of you would go for a contrast study and uh, almost, no, the same, same majority would go for a renal isotope scan, which is probably not a bad idea in a multimorbid high-risk patient. And as the guidelines clearly also say, you should have, ideally you should have a contrast study before you plan any stone uh, invasive treatment. So the stones turned out, you, you can just um, see faintly the IVU on the left side. So the stones turn out to be non-obstructed. And as I said before, then the upper and lower pole. 
Now the left kidney is 67%. So if you were to question, do we have to treat it? Then the answer is probably yes, because that is the better kidney. The other kidney is only one third. So what should be the treatment for this multi, multi uh, morbid, morbidly obese, patient with recurrent urinary tract infections. Okay, I want to have a word here. Uh, two people said chemolysis. Now, I, I'm not quite sure what these people um, have in mind. If you have in mind something like antibiotics or something like that, maybe it's the wrong terminology. Chemolysis is alkalization of urine to dissolve uric acid stones. But these stones are calcium containing, so they are certainly not uric acid stones. Um, ESWL in a morbidly obese patient can be a problem simply of, uh, because of the skin stone distance and positioning of the patient you know, who is uh, morbidly obese and has uh, multiple comorbidities. Flexible URS could be an option. We did opt for PCNL simply because of the stone burden. The pictures were a little bit um, microscopic there, but you could see we, we are dealing here with the stacon stone, partial stacon stone in the upper pole, in the lower pole. So the, the, the total stone burden was more than three centimeters. Okay, so we did this again in a side position with the high spinal. We did two ultrasound guided accesses And on follow-up, we have a small residual fragment where the arrow is. That is all that was left. Now, what do we do with this residual fragment? Shockwave it, flexible URS, wait and watch and long-term antibiotic prophylaxis or send to Aga Khan Hospital. Okay, now most of you say ESWL. Now I'm going back to the X-ray, if I can. Now you see the anatomy here. And the reason why, you can see my arrow, I believe, the reason why with PCNL we couldn't get one of these stones was because it was either here or here where the stone was in a secluded, very sharp angled calyx. So I doubt that with ESWL you will have any success. You may break the stone, but I don't think the fragments will be able to come out. So that's why we did not do ESWL. Now flexible URS in a high risk patient after she had already PCNL is probably a little bit overshooting for a four millimeter or five millimeter stone. So we decided on a wait and watch and long-term antibiotic prophylaxis. Now case five, 50, uh, Hamad, we still have time? Last case, uh, Noor. Okay, good. Now this is a 50 year old female with hyperparathyroidism and she's already on the waiting list for hyperparathyroidectomy. You can see she has a stone on the right kidney and a similar stone on the left kidney. So 
we did a max re scan and her left renal function is the better kidney 70% the right renal kidney is 30%. So what is your initial therapy right PCNL left PCNL bilateral PCNL or bilateral URS. Okay, so you're saying the majority says right PCNL, some would do left PCNL, some would do bilateral PCNL, some would be bilateral URS. Now, if we go back to the X-ray, and you can see, I mean, these are full body X-rays, right? So if you enlarge this, these are quite sizable partial stack on stones. Each of them is about three centimeter. So doing that in one session with a flexible ureteroscope, good luck. Takes you the mo mo most of one day, I would say. Now, the right renal function is 32%, the left renal function is 38%. Now my, and, and most of the people I know uh, would have an approach that you do the better kidney first um, in order to, if something, if it goes well, then you have saved that kidney. So if something goes wrong with the other kidney, it's not so bad because that kidney is then saved. Um, there may be other opinions, but this is usually the current opinion. Um, Bilateral PCNL, I would be reluctant. Um, I do it very, very rarely. I know in Pakistan, there may be other reasons, uh, economical reasons, uh, social reasons, patients traveling from the villages and things like that. So of course that has to be taken into account, but usually we, we like to operate on one kidney, make sure it works nicely and then go to the other kidney. So we did the better side first, as you can see here, the patient is stone free. And after two months, you see the CT scan. So we did the other side two months later, and then, and that is quite unusual. She had her adenomectomy even later because their waiting list was much longer than ours. But of course the right approach would be to um, go to the root for the root cause first, meaning take the adenomas out and then start operating on the stones. Good, if that was the last case, then I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Noor. Uh, it's a beautiful presentation. I think you have taken us through complex scenarios and some of the basic uh, things which are required uh, under the circumstances because uh, urolithiasis is going to be a one major component of uh, both your long case, short case, and talks. So um, I'm, I'm really grateful for Noor and the panelists for their contribution. I would like Dr. Atau Rahman to please say some uh, last concluding words and maybe a few advice for the residents appearing in exam. Uh, you've been an examiner for a very long time. So some, some pearls. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Hamad. I think it has been a very interesting session and uh, Noor has picked up uh, very uh, selective cases uh, which uh, tells us how and guide us how to uh, approach these patients. And an exam for the students, uh, I think uh, one of the things is to really listen to the scenarios or look at the, for example, if it is talks, look at what has been asked and answer only to the questions which are really asked and look carefully. And uh, you can ask for, for example, repeat it, what I mean, what, what really has been asked. And uh, secondly, in the long case, particularly, I think, uh, what I mean, what we expect them, how they would diagnose the case and what different options of the treatment. We don't want them that they are going to be operating surgeons there. What 
they need to tell us the guidelines, according to the guidelines approach to treat these patients. Like uh, Noor mentioned, what I mean, uh, in, through different exercise and voting, what, what, which is the best way of treating these stones. Uh, so my advice to the students should be really uh, to, 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 to compose themselves, listen to the question and answer accordingly. Uh, th th this is my advice to the students. And Ahmad, uh, at this uh, stage, uh, I would really like to thank you for uh, inviting us. And secondly, I think this has been, uh, what I'll say, one of the excellent way uh, nowadays in this era uh, of, you know, that of virtually linking together. And I think uh, uh, looking forward to be, uh, to, to be taking the chair of a president, which I think is a very responsible job, and I would totally, I think, coordinate with all you people. And I hope uh, that you would reciprocate, reciprocate with me. And I think your platform, uh, I think, is a milestone in this country. I think what we'll take this platform as the platform for the Paus Pakistan to really link to the international uh, groups. Uh, and I, I'm sure Noor is there. Uh, who would certainly be uh, supportive of uh, our group as well. And I hope our educational programs uh, will uh, certainly, yes, uh, certainly be linked. And uh, Hamad uh, and uh, uh, his whole team, I think, need, uh, really, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll clap for them that they really uh, have done a wonderful job. Uh, many thanks, Hamad. And, 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 and please convey my feelings to your team uh, uh, in Karachi. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Atta, for these very kind remarks. And uh, with this, I think we have a long evening. So uh, I would uh, just introduce uh, tomorrow's program. We are going to deal with uh, prostate cancer. And we are very fortunate that we have we will have uh, Mr. Naveed Afzal from Dorset, uh, robotic surgeon, great interest in prostate cancer, a wonderful person. And you will really enjoy his insightful comments on the cases to be presented by Dr. Imran Jalbani, day-to-day -day prostate cancer cases. Uh, to wrap up the course, uh, we'll have two presentations on pediatric urology, and we can very well understand that the exposure to pediatric urology for most of the resident is limited. Uh, there are very few pediatric urologists, and we are fortunate that two pediatric urologists are going to talk about posterior urethral valve and clinical decision-making in hypospadias. Two very important topics which you may see as a short case during the examination and maybe if you talk station on it. So see you all tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pakistan time and uh, good luck. And thank you very much and a very good evening to all my panelists and faculty members. So have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.